Are you starting? Okay. All right. Welcome to another Tech Talk. Today we have April Song, who's going to tell us some really cool stuff about modeling engine degradation, which I don't even know what that means, but we're going to find out together. So, April Song, all you. Thanks. Ah. Hi, everyone. Okay. Uh, this is actually a talk that I presented on Data Science Central before. For this lunch tech talk, I might be speeding through some of the slides because it's a little bit long. Um, so, all industries need technology to process and store data. Um, lots of industries are, you know, there's with a lot of emerging technology, different industries are able to collect a lot more data. We're able to um, collect more traditional forms of data as well as such as medical images and um, more analog type data. And with this, it's very important to find the right technology to kind of um, analyze our data and start to do some uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics. Uh, how can we you know, use all this data coming from connected devices to make our homes smarter, make our lives easier? Um, can I have like a fridge send me a text message saying I need to get more milk before I go home and realize I need more milk? Um, can utility companies predict whether or not a tree has fallen, um, fallen on a line before residents start to call in and complain about you know, power outages, right? It's really important that companies, utility companies are able to provide energy uh, to consumers, otherwise they're fined by the government. And how can we use all of this data to you know, prevent bigger scale accidents such as airplanes? Um, this was an accident that happened at SFO two years ago. So the aerospace industry is an industry that's being um, affected by this, you know, emerging data, um, IoT space, and all these technologies. Uh, engines are being fitted with more and more sensors. I think today, engines, most engines have 250 sensors at least, um, and there's been great improvements in the aircraft uh, data networks. We no longer have to wait until a flight lands to collect the data and start looking at it. You can start to analyze the data while the plane is in air. I mean, that's really important when you're trying to, um, you know, prevent any catastrophic disasters. Um, and with that improvement in the networks, you get real-time analytics. So here's Pratt & Whitney's geared tur turbo fan engine. There's 5,000 sensors on this train, uh, on this plane. <laughs> And it's capable of collecting 10 gigabytes of data per second. So that means if I'm on a flight from LA to Tokyo, that can easily give me just under um, a petabyte of data in 12 hours. Um, and you can control sampling rates. Typically in flights or in uh, engines, you see sub-second sampling rates. So you'll get sensor data measurements every um, every 100 milliseconds. So that's a lot of data, yeah? How much more expensive is this censored engine than a regular engine, roughly, if you know? I don't know, but I think um, with, what, with the value that you get from collecting all the data and analyzing it, it's made things a lot more efficient. A lot of airlines have been able to um, improve their engines and improve fuel uh, consumption. Um, actually, our old CEO, Paul, was quoted in like an article saying that um, because of this advancement in like all the data that they're collecting and analyzing, they're able to um, make their operations so efficient that soon you'll see a lot of manufacturers switching to a um, pay-by-the-hour model, pay-by-the-hour business model. So think of it as AWS. Um, you pay for, like an airline will pay for an hour of usage of an engine instead of buying the entire engine itself. Um, so yeah, that's like a pretty big game changer in the industry. You can start to um, rent engines per hour. So why is this a data science problem? So you're collecting all this data and you have some signal. How can you take that signal and turn it into some sort of app like that? You know, and then make some decisions from that signal. 
And you do that by being able to recognize patterns in the trends and um, derive what that signal is telling you. So for example, this signal might be telling me that my patient is about to have a heart attack, right? Or it could be saying um, like a car engine is about to stall and you need, there's something wrong in a car engine and you need to get it checked out. So while you're collecting all this data, it's also really important to actually take that data and start to look into it and see what the data is telling us and then make actions after that. Um, now how can we use it to solve common jet challenges, right? Jet engine challenges. So some use cases we see in this industry um, are you know, predicting thrust demands of an engine. We can predict how much power um, a plane will need for a specific maneuver. Uh, we can ultimately account for other factors that contribute to uh, burn, fuel burn rate and try to um, make it more efficient and reduce fuel consumption. We can also monitor engine health and degradation. Uh, you really want to be able to, you know, um, track how fast an engine is degrading, so you don't put up, so you don't have a faulty um, engine or an engine that's about to die in midair, right, full of people. Um, and you can also better um, schedule maintenance uh, reviews for the engine. And you can also start to uh, detect when faults occur from all the sensor readings that you're getting and try to detect anomalies during flight. Uh, so this is really important when um, you're testing new flights or new airplanes. It's very expensive to send up an airplane for a test flight. Uh, it can cost anywhere to like two million per flight. So if you just did a test flight and there's something wrong, but you don't catch it and you send it up again before you fix it and something goes wrong, you're just losing millions of dollars right there. So things I'll cover right now, um, I'll talk about the sensor data. So I'm gonna be going over a project I did here, uh, but for part of the project I used um, simulated data and this is available online. And I'll go over some of the, uh, the technology stack I use and some models. So the data I worked with was a simulated data set from the CMAPS uh, program. It's a MATLAB program that simulates a large turbofan engine. Um, I won't go into the details of it, but basically you can simulate deterioration and different faults. And in this particular data set, there were just under 7,000 flights um, that came from 35 engines. So the way that the simulation ran was uh, given one engine, you keep flying it um, until it reaches an engine health score of zero. And this engine health score is calculated um, at the middle of the simulated flight, and it's calculated from all the uh, parameters at that time. I don't really have any insight to like the actual equation of how they're getting it, but that's what came in the data set. It was just some kind of score between zero and one, one being healthy, zero being bad. Um, and flights are simulated for a given engine uh, repeated over and over until the score reaches zero. And the flights range from 74 to 85 minutes. There were a total of 30 parameters collected. So this is simulated data. You'll actually see way more parameters. I've worked with uh, real engine data, as you guys probably already know. But that one had like 200, 300 just on the engine alone. So if you start to consider uh, sensor data from different parts of the airplane, like the wing or the wheels, you, you quickly get like thousands of different parameters. Um, and it's really important to kind of use data science and um, let the data tell us. The challenge now is that we have a lot of people who are analysts in the field um, and they're so, um, instead of working with like all the parameters, they'll try to choose a subset that they, they think is most important. Um, and that could, you know, obviously lead to different problems if you don't pick the right subset of parameters to look at. So we have different uh, flight condition parameters, health indicators, pressures, temperatures, um, and different ratios. Uh, and then before I go into the actual uh, analysis, I'll go over the technologies that we used. Uh, this data set I think was about seven or eight gigab gigabytes, so not too much, um, but 
you still, it would not be possible to do it in memory on your own computer. So these are just some slides on, okay, never mind. So with, when you're working with big data, you encounter um, variety and velocity, and you want to be able to, uh, you want to have an architecture that's flexible, right? You don't know, you might have something stored in Hadoop, you might have something stored in a more traditional relational database. And you want to be able to, um, you want to be able to like quickly store your data and quickly access it. You also want it to be pretty scalable so that um, it makes computation uh, quicker, just like uh, Green Plum, which I'll go into details. And you want it, you want your um, environment to have access to all these like other third-party languages um, or packages. You don't want to keep reinventing the wheel. If I need an algorithm for random forest, I'm not going to sit there and code it myself. I want to be able to look in the Python community or our community and use one of their packages. And you want an environment that um, can access other third-party uh, tools like uh, Tableau or um, click view, just to visualize anything with an ODBC, JDBC connection, right? And you can do that with Pivotal. I uh, use Greenplum MPP database. It's basically, you can think of it as uh, multiple Postgres servers. I don't know if you guys are too familiar with Greenplum database or not, um, but you have a master node and your segment nodes and you can, um, do like all of your queries uh, in a distributed fashion. So the way it works is um, very sim kind of like map reduce. Uh, say you want to count like the number of cards or number of hearts in your deck and it's distributed across these segment nodes. Um, the master will send that out and each node will calculate it and then it'll be aggregated to the master level and you'll get your answer. Uh, and I'll go into details uh, on why this is really important later. Uh, so using Greenplum, you get other functions like window functions, which l help you do um, look at different windows of data. So if you're working with time series data, you want to be, you might want to do some smoothing, or you might want to look at like every five, moving five second windows of data. Um, and Greenplum is actually based off of Postgres 8.2, so you get all that functionality. You can also use uh, the procedural language extensions like R and Python, PLR, PL Python, PL Java, PL Perl, and that lets you use um, Python to kind of create your own uh, functions to manipulate and clean data. Uh, and you have access to Madlib. Madlib is a big data machine learning library. It started at uh, Pivotal actually, and we sponsored it. It's now part of Apache. Um, and it's kind of like scikit-learn, but in SQL. So you can call these algorithms in a SQL statement. For example, you could do select uh, linear regression, paren, and then add in your um, parameters, and it'll do all of the, it'll run the algorithm in database. So it eliminates the need to kind of pull out data, um, pull out data from the database and work with it, because that adds a lot of um, time. Uh, so, as I was talking about, um, with that kind of architecture, you get data parallelism uh, through the PL Python, PLR languages. Uh, what that means is, say, uh, we have an interpreter installed on each node, and say, um, here's an example of a function. Uh, you use the, uh, the, the SQL wrapper, or the typical SQL create statement, function statement, you pass in the parameters, and then where those dollar signs start and end, you have uh, just pure Python code in between. And then at the end, you say what language, you declare what language it is. And this is useful when, um, so for example, say I'm working on um, churn modeling, and I want to build a model for each state, because it doesn't make sense to look at the US as a whole. You might see different trend, trends based on what state you're in. So how do I build 50 models in parallel uh, or quickly without waiting? Uh, what's an efficient way? I can write up a function here where I'm calling a function that does a um, 
that runs the model. And then uh, in my SQL statement, I could do a group by state, and that'll give me a model for each state. So essentially, uh, as soon as I run that SQL command, it kicks off 50 uh, different models. Um, and it's really fast. So back to the data that I worked with, this is what um, the typical flights look like. All the flights had the same um, flight plan. So here, this graph is uh, time and altitude on the y-axis, and each color is a different flight. And you see that each flight consists of a, a takeoff phase, um, some climbs, some cruises, and some descents and landing. Uh, the average cruise here was at 35,000 feet for about 21 minutes, and every single flight in this data set had the same pattern. Here are some examples of the time series for the pressure measurements. You see that um, at glance, you see some obvious correlations between uh, some of the pressure parameters. Uh, here's a graph of the engine health over time. So each color is a particular engine or particular uh, plane. And you see that there's different patterns in the way that the health is degrading over time. Huh? Hello? I'm just curious. It seems like the health is getting better for some of them as time goes on. I found that yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. You, you notice that not all of them start off at a one. Some of them start off kind of at point A, and then you notice that it gets better, and then it drops again. Uh, a couple look like they're not degrading at all at the top. And there's different ways that they're degrading. Um, as you can see here, there's about four trends at least. Uh, and one opportunity we have here is to cluster uh, these flights or these planes based on the way that they're uh, degrading. But because in the sample set we only had 35 different engines or 35 different unique planes, um, I didn't go into that use case. Uh, but you can imagine if an airline has 2,000, has a fleet of 2,000 planes, they really want to know which planes are, um, how to segment, find groups of uh, engines that are degrading the same way so they can, um, you know, respectively uh, do maintenance on those planes. Uh, another offered modeling opportunity here is predicting the health score. I didn't do that here because it was simulated data. It would be pretty much reverse engineering um, what the simulator did. Um, but on real data, that would be a really good, cool thing to do. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. So in my data set, I had uh, 25 normal planes, and I had 10 planes that, were, that had faults introduced to them. Uh, so these are examples of the planes that had faults introduced to them. And you see there's, uh, at the red dots, there's a drop in the health score uh, when the fault occurs. And then it kind of continues on to the, uh, the degradation path. And here there are about, uh, out of that 7,000 flights, 1,600 um, came from a faulty engine. So what happens when there's a fault introduced to the flight? Uh, sometimes it's noticeable, like this one here. You kind of see a small dip. But notice how on the, the left is the overall time series. And at first glance, you can't really see that anything happened there, right? It's only when you really, really zoom in, um, you kind of notice a small dip. But when your plane is doing like crazy maneuvers, how do you know if that dip is a real dip in the sensor meetings or if it's some kind of anomaly, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's just not easy to spot most of the times. So now we'll go into the feature engineering bit. So uh, after kind of looking at your data, you start to extract different variables from your data to put into a model. So since here I'm working with time series data, um, the modeling approach I took here was to kind of segment the flights. So we saw earlier that the flights consisted of takeoffs, um, takeoff, landing, uh, and different cruises and different climbs and descents. So I segmented each flight by uh, what phase they were in. And um, in each phase, I took, I took a look at like different um, summary statistics like mean, average, max, max uh, range, median. Um, of the parameters in that time window. 
And then I also calculated different um, summary stats on the rate at which those measurements were changing. A uh, quick look into the correlations between sensors. Um, some of the things we looked at were how correlated were two sensors, um, and are there, do these correlations change over time? Um, if there's a fault in one of the sensors or some part of the engine, you might notice that correlation, you know, two things that you expect to be correlated might no longer be correlated. And these were some questions we had um, and you kind of want to investigate. So two approaches we took. Uh, first, looked at the correlations on the overall flight data set and looked at trends, and then I also did it based, calculated the correlations within um, different flight phases. So like cruise, altitude, so on. Um, here's a chart of uh, like the different correlations between different pairs of parameters. So you notice here there's, I mentioned we were only collecting 30 parameters or 30 sensors uh, of data, but we have, we, when you do pairwise uh, correlation calculations, you end up getting like multiples of pairs. Uh, and you can imagine when you have a thousand parameters and you want to find the um, correlation between every single pair of parameters, it can become very computationally expensive um, and also result in really big data and tables. Um, but yeah, so here we have 435 parameter pairs. Um, you see some that are highly correlated and some uh, highly positively correlated and some that are negatively correlated. And then you also see some that aren't, aren't correlated at all. So some plots of the negatively correlated sensors. Um, and you see here they're like almost perfectly negatively correlated. And then some positively correlated sensors. Again, you see that they're pretty perfectly correlated. So here's a look at uh, the correlation and uh, plot of the altitude of the flight. So you see here that the correlation changes between different parts of the flight. So here we have um, takeoff when it's on the ground. And then once it hits the first, uh, first climb in the flight, uh, you see there's a change in the correlation. And that slope changes too, depending on how quickly or how slowly you're going up in the air. Um, so another interesting use case to use this kind of information is kind of um, having an automatic fashion or way of um, identifying what a plane is doing in the air while looking at its data. This is really important in like military tactics um, to be able to kind of distinguish, hey, this is doing a barrel roll or I don't know, all these different <laughs> maneuvers. Um, and yeah. Okay, so I'll go into the modeling now and I'll kind of speed through these slides. So the first model we did was a clustering of the flights. We wanted to kind of get some more insights on the way that engines degrade. Uh, and how this worked was given the time series for a single um, sensor, let's take a, a pressure parameter. Um, you extract all the summary statistics for all the phases, which I mentioned earlier. And then once you have the features, there's a step that you have to do, um, kind of determining which features are important. So here I did um, feature reduction using uh, VIF, which is an algorithm that kind of tells you uh, if, if you have two variables that are highly correlated, you don't want to put both of them in your model, because then that'll add more noise um, to your model. Uh, so basically, you just want to make sure that all of your, pr uh, in your set of um, model inputs, you don't have uh, two variables that are telling you the same thing pretty much. So after accounting for that, you run it in uh, k-means. Oh, sorry. K-means. And you do this process for every parameter. So I had 30 parameters. Uh, that means I ended up with 30 clustering algorithms. Because um, you want to look at every um, measurement separately uh, for this case and see how the sensor measurement changes over time. K-means clustering. Uh, yeah, and you repeat it for 29 parameters. So here's a look at the results. Uh, this is kind of hard 
to see, but basically what you're looking at is on the x-axis is the flight number from a given engine, and then on the uh, y-axis you see the engine ID, and, you, and then on the y-axis you see the cluster that that flight was um, put into by the algorithm. So we're seeing here that in the beginning it's, it looks like uh, for engine 7, the flights switch between being in cluster 0 and cluster 2. Um, that's what you're seeing here at the top. And then towards the end of uh, the life of that engine, you see that they all start to be clustered. They all start to be assigned to cluster four. And then that's pretty consistent until it dies. And you kind of see that same pattern across all of the engines. Um, and so this is basically telling us that um, we can use this clustering algorithm to kind of get a sense of when is an engine uh, nearing the end of life. Um, yeah, and then you can also kind of see which parameters or you can start to track which parameters are more indicative. Because um, some, some of the parameters didn't show this clear of a pattern. So uh, you have to then go through your 30 models and see which one have this kind of pattern. So uh, that was it for that modeling. And now um, I'll go into another model we did, which was a classification-based similarity metric. So that's basically saying, um, how do we know two flights are, are um, how can we compare one flight to another? Or how can we compare, um, by being able to compare two flights, that can kind of give us a sense of, uh, was there something that happened in one flight that affected the next? Um, and the way that we approached this was using a classification um, algorithm, uh, binary classification. So basically what we did was um, you take two flights, you build a classification model. If the model is able to distinguish the difference between those two flights, then that means those two flights are really different. Um, if that, meaning if the accuracy score of that model is high, then you know that those two flights are very, very different. If the accuracy score is low, then that means the model is having a hard time distinguishing um, if it's flight A or flight B. So that means that implies those two flights are very similar. Uh, so we can use this uh, model accuracy score as a proxy for dissimilarity. How dissimilar are two flights? Uh, so the example I'll go through is um, for every takeoff pre-takeoff phase of a flight, you chunk. You chunk the time series into five second windows, and that becomes your examples for your uh, classification algorithm. So I might have flight A, and I might have a um, hundred five second windows, and flight B also a hundred five second windows. And now I use those five second windows to say, hey, does this given this five second window, did it come from flight A or flight B? Um, and depending on how good my my algorithm, my model is at distinguishing which flight it came from, it'll tell me how similar or dissimilar uh, flight A is to B. Um, and you want to do this for every pair of flights from the same engine. So again, once you do the pairwise for 35 engines, um, and each of these engines had from, I think, 80 to 300 flights, um, I end up building s about 750,000 models. Um, and it took 11 minutes. Uh, yeah, a lot of people were, were like really confused on how we were able to accomplish that, but this is all possible to, uh, because of the distributed framework I'm using. Um, so here are the expected results. So in this graph, you see um, the x-axis is the flight number, flight 1 to n. And then if you take a reference flight, so say this is flight 50, how similar, uh, what's the accuracy score between the um, flights before it and the flights after for those models, right? And so you would expect if something happened um, in that flight, it would be very, very different from the flights before and very, very different from the flights after. So here are the results. Um, Here's one particular engine. If you take a look, say we're looking at flight, the eighth flight from that given engine, and uh, you see the plot of the 
model accuracy scores of all the flights before and after. And if you take a look at early on um, in the early phase of the engine's life, all the accuracy scores are pretty low, meaning all of those early flights are very similar to each other. So, you know, we don't have to worry about anything. But you see that once it starts to hit like maybe flight 100, the accuracy scores start to kind of jump up. So here we're looking at uh, flight eight compared to the later on flights. Um, and that just, uh, so once a uh, model accuracy score jumps, it's saying that there's been something different in the flights, something um, in the engine might have gone wrong, or, the, uh, or it could be just from degradation. Again, here's like flight 47 of that same engine. You notice um, there's like a, all the flights before are still pretty um, similar to it because the accuracy score is low. But then once you hit uh, flight 115, you notice that all the flights before it are really different from that flight and all the flights bef after it are also really different from that flight. So that immediately tells us something went wrong during the 115th flight. Or maybe not wrong, but there was a change in some of the sensors, uh, sensor readings. Um, and this might give an give like an analyst some um, clues on what to look at. And then by the end, you notice that, you know, flight 255 from that engine is just very, very different from the rest of the prior flights. And at that point, you know that something has gone, something's just permanently changed and it's not going back to normal. <coughs> so again, just to kind of reiterate what I said, uh, we saw a trend that uh, earlier flights were more similar to each other and um, obviously more different to the later flights. So in this picture, in this graph here, uh, we're looking at on the x-axis, uh, like your reference flight, the flight that you're looking at, and then on the y-axis, how um, the accuracy score, or the flight B that you're comparing it to, and the color represents the accuracy score. So darker meaning it's more similar, lighter meaning it's more different. And as you would expect, um, all the flights earlier, I'd say maybe around 50, uh, it's all dark green, meaning it's all in the clear, all the same. And then you kind of start to see this um, switch to like a white, a paler green, meaning all the flights start to look different. Um, so you can start to look at different summary statistics of our uh, model results um, and kind of get an idea. I mentioned taking a look at the median and the mean accuracies of um, the flights before your reference flight. Um, and you want to look at like different windows of it too. Um, and with this information, you can start to detect anomalies um, and changes, significant changes. So some more graphs. Uh, here's a graph of, in the blue, the blue is the engine health score that I showed earlier uh, on the few slides. And then the orange is a median, median accuracy score of the flights before, um, and the median accuracy scores of the flights after. And you see here that the green and the orange start to kind of collide and um, hit the blue line right when it's starting to degrade. Uh, so now with this information, you can kind of start to track all of your flights in a fleet. If you have 2,000 planes, you want to kind of see, oh, um, what are the different trends, right? So here are some of the trends we saw in the engines. These two here, these two flights degraded very slowly over time. So you see that the median accuracy score of our uh, regression models uh, kind of increased over time at a much slower rate than the others. Here we see two engines that kind of degraded quickly and you see that it's, um, the accuracy score again increases much quicker than the prior flight, the prior engine that we took a look at. And then um, also this, uh, these model scores can also kind of give us, uh, help us detect faults. Here, not so much. You don't, you, we see a fault, but we don't see um, anything out of the ordinary or unexpected in the trends here. But if we take a look at this particular um, engine, we notice that right when the fault occurs, we see the orange line and the green line, which is the uh, accuracy scores of the flights before and after, immediately cross over. Um, so that can 
you know, immediately tells us there was something very, very wrong in the flight, and it probably wasn't like a degrading factor, it was some kind of fault. Mm, another example, you see again, uh, this one had like a much bigger jump, so um, more alarming. And then finally, we take a look at the engine, the correlations, any potential correlations between engine health and that median accuracy score of uh, the models. And we see here that all the flights um, early on tend to be healthier, um, and all the flights later tend to be uh, less healthy, and that corresponds to higher um, accuracy score, meaning more different flights. Um, and these labels, these are just examples of uh, different types of uh, faulty engines. So there's different components in an engine um, where faults can happen, and these are just graphs corresponding to each of the faults. And you kind of see the same trends for each of the fault, or same pattern, but different correlation trends. Yeah, and that's it. Does anyone have any questions? I have one. Uh, what were like the outcomes of all this research you did? Um, so this particular uh, project was more of a proof of concept. We wanted to show them how you can use our technology stack to uh, handle a lot of data. The actual use cases I worked on with like real data was very different from this. Um, so yeah, no real outcomes. It was also it was simulated data, so it was also different than an actual project. Were you able to use some of the same modeling you used in the simulated data for the real data? Uh, we were, except in the real data, I didn't have as much of, I didn't have a big enough sample set. Uh, the number of flights we had were, I should not be saying, it was a lot fewer. Uh, I basically, no, I couldn't really use any of this stuff on the real data. Um, 